Um, oh, that's me recording. All right, so let's go to the free responses. We're going to look at the question threes, and then we're going to do the question sixes, because three is pretty much all the same thing. It deals with evolution um, and genetics, and then six is exclusively on genetics. So I figure we'll just do three and six on each one. So I'm on exam number three. I just randomly pick three first. So we'll do three questions, three and six. Then we'll do number two questions, three and six, and then one, three and six. Okay. And then at that point, we will have done all of the free responses. And if you guys finished up the multiple choice that was due today, if not due tonight, you know, it's practice, right? Like the AP practice test. Can I do tonight or do Yeah, do tonight. Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. It was due yesterday. Do it tonight. I was going to go over questions you guys had, but what's up? No. So technically, that's the only thing you have. Now, I put up additional multiple choice questions for you guys to work on if you want to. Um, they're by topic. So they're the progress checks. So they go by, it says unit one, unit two, unit three. So they're for the different units. So you can do those at your leisure um, if you want to just get some more practice on them. I just did the multiple choice ones because we've done enough free response, okay? Um, so you can do those whenever you want. That's fine. I'm not grading those. That's just there for you to do. That's all, okay? Because um, some people are like, okay, we've done this all. I still want to do more, which is great. I um, mean, you guys have done like over 200 questions in the last two weeks, so great. Keep it up. Um, tomorrow at this time, you will be wrapping up your free responses. You can pretty much be done. And I'll be sitting here having an anxiety attack waiting for you guys to come up, right? Um, yeah, so you guys are free to come up, um, you know, after the exam and, and, you know, let me know what you thought. Um, I'm not going to do anything seventh period because we've done enough. So we can just relax and just clear your brains. Um, some of you guys, if you drive and you go home early, you want to do that, that's up to you. Um, it, it depends how the day goes. I know some of you guys have games or whatever, so it's right. So but whatever you want to do, it's fine, but I'll be here, right? We just can't talk about specific questions, but I am I the really the one thing I just want to know is how similar the questions were to the three practice tests you did. That's really my biggest thing is were the practice tests, you know, mirroring the difficulty, the type of questions and all that that you guys saw. That's all. Because this is the first time we're seeing the new multiple choice since 2019's exam. Okay. And that's it. Um go ahead. Today, like inside and outside the cell, like two words. Endocytosis, extracellular. Like intracellular, extracellular. Yeah, yep, I'll do that. Remind me, I'll definitely do that. Um, yes, yeah, so what I'm going to do this period is do like the Mendelian stuff, um, some of the Hardy Weinberg stuff. And the next period, if we, you know, finish up the, the Hardy Weinberg, then after that, I want to take requests, you know. Mm -hmm. So whatever you guys want, like, I'll do that. Let me write that down, actually. All right, intracellular. It's so weird. I know, right? It's like very like. Actually, right now, let's write this list down before we forget. Um, so, so intracellular, extracellular. What else do you guys want to touch on next period? Got it. Which one? Yep, I'll do that. Okay. Okay. What else? Got evolution. I don't remember something. <laughs> yeah, we'll do some. Yeah, we're going to do that actually with Hardy Warmberg. So that'll help you. I'm going to do some of the key things with that. Like, I'm going to do some Patrick, Allo Patrick. Yeah, we'll do the selection, all that stuff. Yeah, that's going to come up in the context. That's why I like using the free responses because that gives me a point to jump from. So, absolutely, we'll do that. Okay. And if other stuff comes up, just let me know. And, you know, we can just, you know, we'll go through it. Okay. So, um, let me just get back to this one. Can we do bacteria also? Yeah. Like, what specifically do you want to know about bacteria? What's the I know it all, so no. The, <laughs> the who? The nutrient yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was on the end of the last time. Yep. I'll do that. Okay. Uh, three, two, one. There's three. Two and here's one. Okay, so we're on number three, question three, right? Is that what I started you guys? I'm sorry, number yeah, number three, question three. So researchers grew these populations of identical E. coli, right? In a growth medium that had a low concentration of glucose and a high concentration of citrate. 
right? And it says here the citrate is not typically consumed by E. coli. Okay. So for thousands of generations, bacteria used only glucose as an energy source, and they grew really slow and to a low density, right, because they didn't have a lot of food. This is after about 30 generations, one population emerged that began to rapidly grow to much higher density. They hypothesized that the bacteria evolved the ability to use citrate, so they called them CIT+. Plus. So to test this hypothesis, they grew separate populations of CIT plus bacteria and the original population, CIT minus, in a growth medium that had only citrate, right? So they were on two separate petri dishes. So what's an outcome that demonstrates that the population has evolved? So how do we know that this population evolved? Go ahead. Yeah, maybe they started using the CIT trust to um, have energy. Right, so the fact that they were utilizing a different food source, right? Um, demonstrates that, hey, you know what, this is something that's evolved because originally they were not utilizing the citrate, right? So the citrate's always been in the environment. Now, all of a sudden, hey, there's a, there's a group that's using it, right? So that would demonstrate that they've evolved because now they're using a different food source that they didn't use before, right? And so that probably indicates that what happened in those bacteria or what, what, what occurred. What, what, what occurred inside the bacteria? based upon the fact that, hey, all of a sudden now, there's a bunch that can use citrate, where they didn't use it before. Well, is it, is it the, uh, other, the blob of DNA that makes the mutations in the bacteria? That's it, mutations, right, right. They picked up a mutation, right. They picked up a variation somewhere, right. Oh. So that's probably what would demonstrate that they evolved, right. So one outcome that would demonstrate that would be, again, you see an increase in the population in the CIT plus, right, and also um, the fact that it's most likely the cause of the mutation. Go ahead. Um, for when you're describing it, did you have to say that the mutation was favored? That's why the whole population was able to use citrine as like um. Yeah, you can say it's a favorable variation or favorable change. Oh, okay. Yep. Or it gave them an advantage, right? I didn't know. Adaptation, anything that shows that okay, they have an advantage and that they were able to utilize something that they didn't utilize prior, okay? So what's the dependent variable? What's being measured? Uh, yeah, population size, right? So the size of the populations, right? That's what they were measuring. And then they want you to predict the results by the researchers when they grew the CIT plus and CIT minus in the citrate only. Okay, we kind of sort of talked about that a little bit already, right? In CIT plus, what would they see? Growth and how about sit minus? Right, it's like no growth, right? Because the original population couldn't use the citrate, right? So growing them in the sit minus to be no growth, right? Because they don't have the mutation. So they just want you to project it. So you would say that in sit minus, there would be no growth, right? So there wouldn't be like a decreased growth, they wouldn't die. Yeah, they would, they, yeah. Well, actually, you would have no additional growth. You could say they would decrease, yeah. Yep. You could say there's a decrease in the size of the population or there's no growth at all. You know, you put those bacteria there and they sat there and that was it. So, yeah, they died. Actually, that's a better answer, I think. They died, yep. And then it says here, the researchers claim that the mutation increases the fitness of the bacteria. So what supports the claim? If they're the most fit with that phenotype, what are they able to do? Survive and reproduce. Yep. So they can survive and then reproduce. That's what evolutionary fitness is defined as, right? The ability to not only survive, but reproduce, right? Reproductively successful organisms are the most fit, okay? Now, that population that emerged within that petri dish, what kind of evolution was that? Like, it was a new species that formed, right? So technically, it was, it was speciation. So remember we looked at two kinds of speciation? Yeah, it's sympatric, right? Sympatric because they're in the same population. It's in the same place. And so they evolved within that group. Remember, bacteria and plants exhibit sympatric evolution, right? They, they, they start out within one population because they're sedentary. They don't move around. The opposite of that is what? Allopatric, right? And allopatric is because of... I'm getting excited. Here we go. Um, it's because of adaptive radiation, right? You start off at one point and you radiate out to new environments, right? And you establish new species because they're exposed to different pressures, right? Different selective pressures, right? So what's the selective pressure in this case? What's exhibiting natural selection? The 
food sources, right? The citrate, right? So the sources of food, those are examples of, of the selecting agents, right? The agents of natural selection. In this case, is the citrate and the amount of glucose, right? That's determining who survives and who grows, okay? Um, so we kind of mentioned that, you know, with this population evolving, we came to the idea that, okay, this is the result of a mutation, right? So mutation is one source of variation. What's another source of variation for evolution? Meiosis, Meiosis right, crossing over, right? So meiosis and crossing over, that's your other source of variation, right? Okay. And when you have those two combined, that's how species evolve, right? And you only see those variations having an impact when there's a change in the environment, right? So if the environment's stable and everything's the same, no big deal. But now all of a sudden you introduce something different in the environment, you know, a new pressure, a disease, a predator, a change in the food source. Organisms that have those adaptations, now suddenly they're favorable, right? And they pass those traits on. Okay, so um, Darwin talked about all that stuff, right, with the different types of, well, actually, let me move on to the next thing. Um, let's do, actually, we'll come back to three, because I want to do number three on FRQ2, which is the one I think that deals with the mice. Is it the mice one? Yeah, okay. So this is just like that rock pocket mouse video I showed you guys, right? We had the mice on the different colors of sand, light and dark, right? Um, and that's actually what they had here, right? And so they did the same thing. They said, okay, we have mice that were set up um, with light and dark colored sand, and they isolated them ex against everything except these birds, right? Um, and they put 500 mice out there. They did equal amounts of light and dark on either side. Um, and after several generations, they sampled the populations, and they saw that the light sand ones were on average lighter than the dark sand ones, right? So how do they determine the evolutionary fitness of the mice? That's actually what we were just talking about, right? Say it again? Reproductive right, the reproductive success, right? Which phenotype was more reproductively successful, right? So they determined this by measuring the size of the populations before and after. And wherever there was an increase of one phenotype, Right, that told them it was more successful, right? Because it could survive those changes. So, the more reproductively successful they were, right, uh, the more fit they were. Okay, that's kind of like the, the simple way of saying that. And so, what was the independent variable? So, what was being manipulated here? Yeah. So, which what is it? Yep, the environment. Right. So, the color of the sand. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I was thinking, like, I wasn't sure whether it was that or whether it was time, because you're looking at the way it changes over time. I was thinking about the, um, like, if you were looking at how it changes between, you start with, you know, equal, equal, and right. you shift with it. Right. This was actually, but what they manipulated were, was the background. That's the thing that they changed. And then they monitored over time if there were changes. So what they measured was a change in the population over time based on the environment they were in. So they were looking at the change over time was what they were measuring. Because they were basically, well, here's generation one, here's generation two. But it was based upon the substrate that they altered. So that's why that's considered the independent variable. So, more, so, so whenever you have like a, an experiment like this one where you want to see the effect of one thing on the other. Right. That's what you should focus on for the Correct. Yep. The effect of sand on the population size. Right. And the you know the population size was how many mice did they get over a time period. So that's what they were actually measuring. So the time period was part of what they were measuring. Year one, year two, year three, or four, year five. They manipulated the substrate which affected what was living in those two areas. So they were looking at the effect of the substrate on the phenotype. That makes sense? Got it. Would the phenotypes be the dependent variable? Yeah, the numbers of individuals with each phenotype is the dependent variable. So how many mice with each phenotype survive? That's what they were measuring, you know, the population size of each group, okay? Null hypothesis. So what would be a null hypothesis for this? Go ahead. It's random and it's not, what I said, the survival rates are not dependent on the sand color? Yep, exactly, right? Survival of mice is not dependent upon sand color. Right. Well, the color of the background does not affect the phenotype of the mice. So a null hypothesis means that whatever you're measuring has no effect. So in this case, they were measuring 
what's the effect of the environment on the number of phenotypes we see? The null hypothesis for this would state that changing the environmental background, changing the color of sand has no impact on the phenotypes that we see. To get technical, it has no impact on the frequency of the phenotype, which means the percent. So if the null hypothesis was correct and they did this, they would see no change in the population, you know, over time if they changed the substrate, which means, okay, there has to be something else that's affecting it. Go ahead, push it. I answered it? Okay, go ahead. Could they use migration for the null No, because the reason why is they were, they were enclosed. So they were in enclosures and they were isolated. Yeah. Go ahead. Fur color doesn't affect your evolutionary fitness. Would that be like a pattern? That's what I did too. But I said it doesn't benefit the revolutionary fitness of the mice. Fur color has no impact on it. It might. That might be one. Yeah. Because the null is that. By, that it's random. Yeah. Like, that might be okay. I think that might work. Because they were really looking at, they were really trying to determine the effects of natural selection on fur color. Yeah. So if right. you're saying fur color has no effect, on no. The evolutionary fitness of Yeah, because the fur color has to do with their fitness. If, yeah, you know, so if you change the color of the fur, I'm stretching it a bit, but I think that would work. Yeah, and the first one it said how. How the scientists determine the evolutionary fitness? Right. Uh, you might get. It could be wrong. Though. That might not be because fitness is referring to their reproductive success. Right. That's yeah. So really, what the null hypothesis is stating is that the two variables don't. There's no relationship totally. between the two. Right. So I would say to play it safe. I would say that um, the fur color is not impacted by the light and dark color sand. So the, the background environment does not affect the uh, survival of preferred colors or the phenotype. I would do that. Yep. Okay. And this is the scientists claim that changes in the frequency were the result of natural selection. So how is that justified? Go ahead, John. The color of the sand makes some of the mice stand out. They'll die to the predators and the phenotype that matches the sand will survive and reproduce. Yep. Do you, you have anything different or was it the same? Right, yeah, so basically you had to make a connection that, okay, um, you know, natural selection, the predators are picking off the mice. So if they have that light or dark colored background, depending upon the color of the mouse, that's going to affect its ability to be seen. So darker mice survive on darker backgrounds because predators can't see them. Light mice survive on lighter backgrounds because they can't be seen by predators either. So as long as you have something along the line of that, making that connection between, you know, not being able to get picked off um, because that's who's doing the selecting. Right, that predators are unable to see them on those dark or light backgrounds, respectively, and they have a better chance of surviving. Okay, what'd you think of this one? Um, it was good, yeah. I hope you get something like this, that would be great. Um, so that's three, and then let's do three on the last one, which is number exam one. I think we did this already. <laughs> what are they doing? I don't know. Who is it? I don't know. Oh, this is that's fun now. This is kind of earth science thing. All right. <laughs> Something with earth science. Uh, earth science was so boring when I was in high school. It's so great. Yeah. This is the one on the pigeons. Number three. So we're going to do all the threes now, then we'll do all the sixes on one. Yeah. And then what we'll do right after this, we'll go to number six on this one, and then we'll go to six on the last one, and that's it, because I think we actually answered number six on one of the other ones. So this is, again, the use of evolution. This is the same thing as the peppered moth experiment. Oh, yeah, we answered six on this one, or this Okay. Yeah, we did. Yeah, six we did. Yeah, one of these. Yeah, that's the one. It was on this one? Okay. All right. So we just have two more, which is perfect. Those are the evolution. So, I mean, genetics. So, this is just like the peppered moth experiment. Remember I told you about that, how prior to the Industrial Revolution, all the trees were light colored, right? And then, so the white moth had a benefit, and then in the darker background, the dark ones benefited. This is the exact same thing, right? So, they did this experiment, right? They did the coloration of lice. What they did is they took 25 lice from a random sample from a wild population, and they put 25 lice into a, a group of black pigeons and a group of white pigeons. 
right? And then half of the fissures from each collar group were fitted with a harmless mouthpiece that stopped their beaks from entirely closing. And so they couldn't remove the lice, right? But they were still able to eat. And then they isolated them and kept them in the same conditions, right, um, for 24 days. And then they observe these principles. So what's the importance of phenotypic variation on louse body color? Right? Why, what's the importance of having these variations? Survive right, it's gonna affect survival, right? So by having these different variations, it's important to have that so that you can survive in different environments, right? So basically you've got a diverse population here, right? So by having variation, that permits survival in changing environments. Okay. And the simplistic form of this is, yeah, if the environment's lighter, the lighter one survives. If it gets darker, the darker one survives. But what that means is that you've always got lice surviving, right? No matter what happens in the environment in terms of color, you're always going to have individual survival, right? So having variation is important um, because that's going to allow you to survive different environmental changes, right? Or survive in different environments, okay? Why do they keep the lighting conditions constant? Okay. So the pigeons can't see some easier in brighter light than in darker light. So they kept it constant, right? Which means, so I think what that means is that they didn't, um, they didn't keep the lights on for 24 hours, right? They had the lights on and they had the lights off, right? So what's the importance of doing that? So that they can see how each um, thing survives based on. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, got it. To like isolate the independent variable. Yeah, right. It's about making sure that you keep everything constant so that you don't have another variable in place, right? If you're changing the lighting conditions, that might make the, the pigeons go berserk, right? If you kept it dark all the time, the poor things wouldn't know what the time it was, right? So literally, you're doing this to keep like their normal environment of day and night, day and night. But it also eliminates another independent variable, right? By keeping the humidity constant and the temperature constant, you know that you don't have something else that's affecting it, right? You can keep the lights on all the time. You just have to make sure you do that consistently for all the pigeons. You can have them on for 12 hours, on off for 12 hours. You just have to keep that consistency, right? So the, the importance of this was to eliminate an independent variable and control all the variables in the experiment, right? Go ahead, and then. Did you say that it um, increases the validity of the experiment? But why? So it makes it more valid, right? But, Right. It keeps constant conditions and eliminates other variables affecting it, right? It reduces other variables impacting it. Like, Tommy was, like, really precise with that. Like, it eliminates another independent variable. Basically, you want to control all the variables, right? Okay. Good. How do you know whether you're talking about, like, the color of the light or, like, the color of the lighting conditions? Like, how do you know? You don't. Know, they just said amount of light. Okay. So they kept the amount of light constant. So whatever that means is they kept it constant. So it wouldn't have an impact on... The pigeons. A lot of people fall into the trap of this, like, oh, they kept this this way so that they could see it. People started relating the pigeons' ability to see or not see because of light conditions, but that wasn't the case, right? Light was being kept constant, so this way it wasn't a variable, right? Because we just really were concerned about the background color of the feathers. We had light feathers and dark feathers, right? If you start saying, well, light and dark environment and light and dark feathers, now you have two variables. So what's affecting it is the Feather color affecting survival, or is it the light? So that's why you kept the light constant. Follow me? Yeah. So if anybody wrote down, oh, it's light and dark, this way it affects the pigeon's ability to see the lice, that's not correct because now it's, a, it's another variable, right, that's affecting the pigeon's ability to see. So basically you're doing this to just keep all the environmental conditions constant so that you don't have any other variables affecting it. Does that make sense? Okay. Then it says, produce, uh, predict the most likely effect of pigeons cleaning their feathers on the phenotypes of lice after four years. So what would happen? This is an obvious question. It's not a trick one. Got to jump. The phenotype Yeah, the phenotype of matching environment, right? You'll see more light mice on light pigeons and dark mice on uh, dark lice on dark pigeons. Right? And that would be your reasoning for that, right? Because the reasoning for this would be, um, well, the lighter lice can survive a light background and they're harder to see, and the darker lice can survive in the darker feathers because it's also more difficult to see. <clears throat> and that ensures that lice always survive. My kids both had lice at the same time. It was horrible. I never had it when I was a kid. I was like, oh. 
I had a microscope. I took a microscope home from school and every day we're like, you know, rushing them out and looking like, yeah, that's one. Cause then you can't see like, is that, is it, is it a dot? Is it skin? Like, I'm like, oh, it's, it's got legs. Yep. It's, I'm like, oh. How do you get rid of like, what do you get? There's a shampoo that you use. You just have to brush them out every night. There's a special lice shampoo you get and it kills it. My kid's hair is like down to here. It's like, oh. Also, pause it forever. But we each took one kid a night and like, okay. You know, I got this one, you know, we just with the light. So we had these two like lights with the goosenecks on them. We just this is just what I want to do for three hours after dinner, you know. It was like great. I was like, everybody's gonna shave their head. No, I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding, guys. So the lighter lights will thrive the lighter dark, right? Correct. Yep. And the darker ones thrive in the darker one. Okay. So now let's jump to number six. But this one we already did six on. So this is what? Number one. So let's go to exam two. Number six. Number two. Yep, exam two, number six. Oh, I love this one. This hits so much in genetics. I love it. Okay. So, question, exam two, number six. And then after this, we have one more to do, and then we're trying to get them all. Ooh, okay. So this they talk about fruit flies, and they say that it's a fruit fly that's used by researchers in genetic studies. Okay, so you know that this is about genetics. So it says members of the species have two of each of four different chromosomes. They have the sex chromosomes, which are X and Y, and then you have three orosomes. So fruit flies only have four chromosomes, right? Not a lot there. They're studying this, and they conducted genetic crosses to investigate, and this is important, a particular X-linked recessive trait encoded by a single gene, right? Affected flies have the trait. So they're telling you it's recessive, and it's, it's X-linked, and if you're affected, that means you have a trait. So X-linked means it's on what chromosome? The X chromosome, right. right? And so they gave you the table here, right? And you can see that there are four crosses. And in the first one, if, if the females are not affected, but the males have the trait, no one has the, has the trait, right? And then in this one, if it's an affected female with an unaffected male, half of your offspring have the trait. And when you look at male versus female, all the males have it, right? In this one, they're both unaffected, right? So nobody seems to express it. But when they have offspring, half of the males have it, right? Um, but none of the females have it. And in the last one, if they're both affected, everybody's got it, right? So what are the genotypes of the male and female flies in cross two? So in this cross, what would be their genotypes? So literally what they want you to do is write the X's and the Y's, right? Um, and then you have to just pick a letter for an allele, right? So use a letter. Whenever they do this, use letters that look different. Like capital A, lowercase A. Go ahead. I have a good question. Go ahead. It says, like, in the first one, you can see that when the males are affected, uh -huh. their offspring is. Does that mean that it's recessive? Yes. Okay. And they tell you it's recessive. They told you. Oh. Yeah. Always read the little blurb. The little blurb is real important to read, right? Because it tells you everything. So you know that it's recessive, right? Yep. It's recessive. So now the female in number two is affected. So what would you write in terms of? Big A's or little A's for her? Yeah, she's little A, little A, right? So and we write this in our answer, do we have to write this out? No. That's what you would write. When they say identify, they just want you to give one thing, right? Describe means, you know, elaborate on it, right? Talk about it. Describe what it is. Be descriptive, right? Give examples. If they want you to explain, right, do that. Explain things. Show the process, right? Evaluate means say... Yes, this is valid or not valid, and then give a reason as to why, okay? So identify the cross in which the female parent was most likely heterozygous. So which one? Three. Yeah, three, right? She's got to be heterozygous in three, right, because half the males have this. Remember, with sex-linked traits, the males tell you what the female was, what the mother was. So if half the males are affected, that means the female, the mom, has half of her alleles affected, right? So what that female would look like is this, right? She has half unaffected, half affected, right? And then if you cross that with a male who's unaffected, okay, these are your females, right? Big A, little a. Uh, oh, sorry, it's an unaffected male. Big A, little a. Right? And right here, that's your male who's affected, right? 
25% of the offspring, right? Right there, and then 50% half of your males, right? So then they say here, the researchers hypothesize that crossing any unaffected female and an affected male results in a 0% chance of producing an affected male. So it's an unaffected female and affected male. So they're saying if you do this all the time, you're always going to get zero, right? Evaluate that. Is that valid? So could we say if the female is homozygous dominant, that's correct, but if they're heterozygous, it's not? Correct. Yep. So you basically would say, no, that's not valid because if the female is hybrid, right, if mom is like this, right, and dad is affected, right, which is an X with a little AY, they're going to have offspring that have it, right? Half the males will have it, at least, right? So um, if the female is hybrid, then you can still have affected males. So, yeah, that's how you write that. You say, no, this is not valid because... If you have a hybrid female, she will have offspring males who have it. Okay. And then the last one is there's that mitochondrial gene. So these results exclude the possibility that it's mitochondrial. How come? Go ahead. Because it's not passed from the mother to the daughter. Like it mimics sex like so it's traditional. So you can see that the inheritance can be passed on by both parents, number one, right? Because if you have affected males and affected females, all the offspring have it. Right? Whereas you have an affected female and an unaffected male, half the offspring have it. Right? So just by looking at this, you can see that, you know, if both parents have it, everybody's got it. Right? Um, so if the, if the male has it, they can pass it on. The other thing is, because this female is heterozygous, can you ever be heterozygous with mitochondrial genes? The answer is no. Right? So the other thing you could also say is, you know, in number three, you have a heterozygous female. Right? Because in the mitochondria, right, we only get it passed on from the mother. So mitochondrial genes are only inherited from one parent, right? So you only get one copy of the gene, right? Where everything else you have two copies because you're getting one from each parent, right? So for mitochondrial genes, you can never have a situation where there's a hybrid, okay? Because you only have one allele. Go ahead. If a female has a mitochondrial gene, would all of the kids that have? Yes. Okay. Yep. So, and that's the other thing. If a female has the trait, all the offspring have the trait, right? And again, you see that here. The female has the trait, half the offspring have the trait. So that's another piece you could say, right? Um, but what this is showing you here, there are two things it shows you. Number one, it shows you that both parents can pass the trait on, right? And the second piece is that if you have an, a, a hybrid, you can't have that with mitochondrial genes, right? Mitochondrial genes, only one parent passes it on, and you can't have hybrids, okay? Are we all right with that? How do you feel about the sex link thing? Are we, are we solid? Yeah. Okay. We're good? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that one's done. The last one is in free response number three, question six. And then we're really, really done. Whoa. And I like this one because, again, they're going to give you examples of genes you've never heard of. Don't panic. It's just context. They're giving you a scenario so that you can answer a question based on the scenario, right? So they give you these, they tell you the kidney filters the blood, right, and removes substances, right, and excess water is urine, right? Wonderful. We all know our kidneys make urine. Half of us probably have to go take care of that right now anyway, right? So we'll do that in a few minutes, right? Then it tells you that there are two different genes, right? Uh, that encode a part of a transport protein that is found in the plasma membrane, okay? All right, so we got genes that code for transport protein. And then they tell you that this transporter moves amino acids across the membrane. So we already know that amino acids can't cross the membrane by themselves, right? So they need this transport protein to do this. And then they tell you that mutations in both of these genes are associated with an increased level of the polar amino acid cysteine in the urine, right? And that's called cystinuria, right? So they took seven people with a family history, and what they did is they measured the amount of cysteine in their urine, okay? They also sequenced their DNA to figure out, okay, do you have normal forms of this gene or mutant forms of it, okay? And you can see the results here, right? A minus means they have the two mutations. A plus means they have no mutation, right? So if they have minus minus, that means both alleles have a mutation. 
If they're plus plus, they're normal, right? You guys want to take a break? Or you want to do this and then take a break? Like, what do you want to do? Just do it. I'll shut the door. All right. If you need to go to the bathroom or whatever, this is the one. Right? It's over my kidneys. All right. So when you look at this, you can see the concentration. And you can see how that relates to whether or not they have mutations, right? So first question they ask you is identify the person that exhibits cystinuria. And that's one of Yep. But also cystinuria, remember, is when you have lots of cysteine. In the urine, so which ones have the highest amount? Yeah, John. If it's plus or minus, do they have the mutation? They have the mutation, right? But they have a normal. So what does this mean? They're what? Normal. They're right. They're heterozygous, right? They're hybrid, right? So this is the, these guys have both. So if they're heterozygous, do they have the problem? Um, they may have some of the problem. Yeah. Yep. Let me see. Did they say if it's recessive or not? One. Yeah. So individual one definitely because it has the highest concentration here, right? Yeah. Okay. Then they want you to know what is the relationship between the total number of mutant alleles and the concentration of cysteine in the urine. The higher the concentration, the less the amount of mutation. Right. So as the concentration goes up, right? Remember, minus means they're mutant. It would be higher the um, mutation. Right. So the more concentrated it is, the more likely they have the mutations, right? So the relationship is that, you know, more mutant alleles means higher concentration. Good. Can you say that the opposite way? Like, the more mutations you have, the higher concentration? Yes. Yep. That's actually a better way of saying it. Yep. So, more mutations, higher concentration. You see that, right? Down here, you know, they have one mutant version here. Over here, we have a mutant version and they, you know, they have it there, right? Okay, so I like this one. There's a, they have this hypothesis. Mutations in the SLC7A gene, right, in this one, they're saying that if you have a mutation in this gene, that that has a greater effect than a mutation in this one. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, the first gene, right? So is this a correct hypothesis then? Right? It's saying that 7A has a greater effect than this one. So th what they're saying is that this column has a greater effect. If you have a mutation, you're going to have a greater effect on the transport of cysteine than if you have a mutation here. So which one? So you're saying if you have a mutation in this one, you're going to have more cysteine going on. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Which way is it going? Is it going like is it saying transport them from the cell into the blood? It's just saying across the membrane. So it would probably be going from the urine into the blood. Yeah. To retain the amino acids so they don't lose it. Got it. Wait, so what's the right answer here? What do you think? What's the correct? Yeah. So one reason I think yes, because individual three has a double mutation on the first one, and mm -hmm. it's only at eleven. Let me see who this is. Hold on. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Mhm. Mm there is one. It definitely is one. Yeah. No, there absolutely is one. It might be buried in like uh, like multiple postings. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's all right, man. Thanks for doing that. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Gotcha. Bye. Okay. So what they're saying here is if you have if you have the mutation present in this gene that it has a greater effect on the transport, which means it's not going to transport well, right? I, I think, yeah, because individual three. Well, I'm saying yeah, that the mutation, that first one, there's barely anything. Right. 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 Okay. So if you have both of these mutations this way, you have a high, the highest concentration. If you have the mutations the other way, it drops down a bit, right? 
right? No. So it's not correct. You're right, it's not correct, right? When you have the mutation present here and here and here, it has a greater impact, right? If the mutation um, is present here, right, it doesn't have as much of an impact, okay? If you look at three and four, right, when this is mutant and both of these are normal, it's 11. When it's the opposite, this drops down, which means that turning this off, mutating this has a greater effect. It means you're not allowing as much cysteine to get taken back in, right? Okay. So you could really say, no, this is not a correct hypothesis because when you look at individuals three and four, that's the best one to look at. When one is mutant versus the other, this one has a much higher uh, concentration, which means the transport proteins are not working well. Okay. And even with these two, it's the same setup, right? This has a higher concentration than this one. Okay. Does that make sense? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. And then it says, explain how the data support the claim that cysteine is a large polar molecule. So how do we know it's a large polar? Go ahead. Right. It needs a transport protein to transport, right? So if the transport protein doesn't work, cysteine can't go across the membrane, right? And that tells you it's got to be big and, and charged, right? Because we all know that big molecules can't fit. It's got to charge. Right. That's all of them, right? So you did all three of those, right? And then you did all three or almost all three of the multiple choice, right? Yeah. Go ahead. So tomorrow did six questions all of me now? So you got 90 minutes for each part, right? So each part it's 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 90 minutes. So you got 60 multiple choice on part one, right? And then again, calculators, you guys can bring your calculators with you. You can use your graphing calculator. Um, you can use a regular scientific calculator. I'll have extra calculators down there if you need any, okay, just in case something happens. Um, part two, you've got six free response. You've got the two big one questions, which are 10 points each, and then the four four pointers, okay? Um, they're not going to, they're just going to tell you start writing, you start, right? They're not going to tell you, okay, your 20 minutes is up, you should move on to the next question. So you need to pace yourselves, right? So just keep track of your timing and everything and what you're doing, okay? You can answer the questions like, you know, A, B, C, D, E, right, whatever it is. You can answer them like that. You don't need to make it an essay. So you can just do A, B, C. You can also skip around. You can do, like, part B first, C, D, and then go back and do A, right? Just make sure it's clearly marked, right? They'll know where to find it. Like, the graders are teachers like me. So they'll look. They'll say, okay, here's A. So that's on the next page, okay? Um, just pace yourself. That's the biggest thing, okay? Don't get stuck on one question for too long. Right. Remember, these are four. These are a point each. So if any one of these is giving you a hard time, skip it. Go on to the next piece. Right. These are not necessarily related to each other. So you can answer C, you know, without worrying about B. Okay. And then go back to it later. Okay. And if you don't go back to it later and your time runs out, hey, at least it's one point versus you spending so much time on this that you don't answer three more questions. Right. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So. For these, yeah, each of these is worth a point, right? And then on the, like the big questions, you just look wherever you see the bold print term, that tells you the point. So, it, like for each one of these, it's one, two, three, four. Like some of the other ones, it says you know define and explain. Okay, so that's two points, right? And the graph itself is going to be a graph that's three points. Okay, do a line graph unless they tell you to do a bar graph, right? And remember your you have your error bars. Okay, that shows you your significance. You guys are good with that, right? Okay. All right. Um, all right. We're good. We're okay with the genetic stuff. Okay. Let's do some Hardy Weinberg, and then we'll address, which will help us with some of the evolution stuff. Uh, and then we'll do actually let me do intracellular versus extracellular. Intracellular means uh, within the cell. Okay. So that's intracellular transport. It's transport inside the cell, right? Intracellular digestion. That's the lysosome digestion within. Extracellular is the outside environment. The extracellular matrix is. This material that's outside of all of our cells, it's got all dissolved things in it, proteins, amino acids, and stuff. That's what we're, cells pull in, okay, from what's in the extracellular component. Got it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you guys have to go to the bathroom or anything, just, don't, just go. You don't have to ask. It's okay. It's college. We're there, right? We're pretty much done. That's what you do in college. You just get up and go. Like, you don't raise your hand to go to the bathroom. It's like, oh.
it's, a, it's kind of weird because like I remember like sometimes like you just go out just to like go get like a candy bar from the machine or something like it's a two hour lecture it's like okay um all right so we're good with that right okay then we'll do electron transport and last we'll do some evolution now so Hardy Weinberg right Hardy Weinberg tells you when populations gene frequencies don't change okay so with Hardy Weinberg it's about the frequency of the alleles okay. So what you're looking at is the frequency of the dominant allele and the recessive allele. Sometimes with the Hardy-Weinbergs, they're going to um, give you these scenarios where you have um, three genotypes, and after 10 generations, these are the other three, and they want you to calculate the frequencies of the alleles. Okay. So did I give these to you guys yet or no, the Hardy-Weinbergs? No, let me give this to you. I don't know who was here yesterday. Get the sub. So let me just give this to you. So we're going to just jump around on a couple of these, and then... You've done most of these in class, so that's it. I didn't get you guys yet. Okay. Remember the five, the five conditions of Hardy Weinberg, right? They say that population's gene frequencies will remain unchanged if there is what? Large no, population. large population, right? What does a large population prevent? Genetic drift. Genetic drift, right. Do you guys remember? Is that it? Do I need more? You need one, right? Let me print it. For some reason. If it's on school, you have to just take a screenshot of it. Yeah, I can print it. It's um, I have it on EP Classroom. Uh, let me see. And I had to actually put it here. I'll print it in the back. It takes a minute. Who else needs one? You guys got? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we have large population, which prevents genetic drift, right? What is genetic drift by definition? It's an allele frequency. Yeah, it's a change in allele frequencies, right? And it's random. And it's because the population is small, right? So there are two cases where you get small populations. The first one is you get a cataclysmic event, you add a big population, and all of a sudden now it's narrowed down to a small group, right? So what is that called? What is it? Yeah, the bottlenecking effect, right? Remember the bottleneck? A population bottleneck? Is where your population goes from a large population and it bottlenecks down to a small number of individuals who don't have diversity. Think endangered species. Okay, endangered species have all gone through a population bottleneck. Right, they're not as diverse as they once were. There's a risk that they could actually, you know, go extinct because they don't have enough diversity. Right. The other example is when populations radiate outward and they go into new environments. They establish themselves as a new population. Right. Now, if that population is isolated, right, it's not interacting with anyone else, that population becomes a founder, right? Remember the founder effect? Okay, the Amish, right? Founder effect is when a population goes, to a small portion of a population establishes itself in a new place and it's not genetically diverse, okay? And it's he's isolated, right? And so what happens is they don't represent all of the original members of the population, right? That's what happened with the Amish. That's the best example I can give of that. Right? Pennsylvania Amish people, they moved out from, I think they came from Germany originally, um, and they established themselves in Pennsylvania, and they stayed isolated. And those founders, um, because of their isolation, you had a very small gene pool. right? And so you have limited genetic variability there. And they suffer from a lot of genetic issues. Okay. So some of the questions in this packet are repeats, and some of them or not. So I'm going to jump around to a couple that we haven't done yet, just to kind of reiterate some of the Hardy-Weinberg things. Okay. So are we okay with bottleneck and founder effect? I got one right. Good. Okay. Everybody's got one right. We're good. Okay. Um, speciation, allopatric, sympatric. We did that before, right? Right. So allopatric is the result of adaptive radiation, right? You move outward, your population, the original population becomes overcrowded, right? Too many resources, and so you spread out to find a new place to live, right? And in doing so, you establish new populations in different areas, right? Okay. So remember with Hardy Weinberg, um, you're going to be given the formula. So the nice thing about it is um, you don't have to worry so much about memorizing anything. Let's go to question four, okay? Because one, two, and three, we did that already. That was that graph with the line, right? 
So four, five, and six deal with this question. So it says your survey reveals that 25% of a population of 1,000 individuals have attached earlobes, right? And they tell you it's homozygous recessive. They're always going to tell you if it's recessive or not, right? So what is the frequency of the recessive allele? So how would you calculate the frequency of the recessive allele? So what are they giving you? In the stem of the question. They're giving you Q squared. Right, that's Q squared, right? So they're giving you Q squared, right? And you need the frequency of the allele. So how do you get the frequency of the allele from Q squared? Right, the square root of 0.25, right? Yep. So now, let me just do this. For some reason it wasn't sharing earlier. Okay. Let me go to my Hardy Weinberg. You guys at home, this is right here, Hardy Weinberg review. I have two copies of it. Doesn't matter. Right. So the correct answer to this would be square root of 0.25, right? Which is this. Okay. That's your recessive allele frequency, right? And then the next question says, unlike other natural populations, this population is characterized uh, in which of the following ways? Yep, it's A, right? There's equilibrium, right? If it's in hardy weinberg there's no gene flow, there's no genetic drift, right? There are no mutations, and we have random meeting, right? Which means everybody reproduces and passes their genes on, right? Okay, so these four bullets right here show what happens when evolution is going on, right? This is the result of being in equilibrium, right? Being in hardy weinberg conditions, your allele frequencies remain unchanged generation after generation. Okay, finally, I can get these both on the same page. Okay, I'm sorry, this printed weird. It's just how they did it. So if P is the frequency of your dominant allele and Q is the frequency of the recessive allele, which of these represents your dominant phenotype, right? So which one of these shows the phenotype? Which one? D, right? D represents P squared plus 2PQ, right? Which, you know, is equal to big A, big A and big A, little a, right? That's what P squared and 2PQ are, right? P squared is your dominant phenotype, I'm sorry, homozygous dominant, and 2PQ is your hybrid genotype, right? Together, these represent the dominant expression of the trait, okay? Are we all right with that? All right, so now we're gonna do some of these questions. Let me look at my list. Four, six, let's go to 11. These we've done already. Okay. So this is one of those where you're gonna to have to calculate the Q squares and everything, right? So it gives you this disease. Again, disease you've never seen, Ellis Van Krebel syndrome. It's a recessive genetic disorder that includes the characteristics of short stature and extra fingers or toes. So in the general population, this occurs one in 150,000 births, right? In the isolated population, it's one in 500. So then they want you to assume it's the both in hardy weinberg conditions, which describes the difference between the frequency of the allele, right? That causes this in the general population and the frequency of the allele in the isolated one. So they want you to figure out the frequency of this allele. So what are they giving you here? One in 150,000 is equal to what? You want decimals? Right, you want decimals, right? Okay. What does that represent? Right, that's Q squared, right? So then you have to get the square root of this, right? So this equals Q squared. So what's the square root of 0 0.00006667? Point zero zero two, right? I think it was like point zero zero two five, right? And then you have to do one in uh, five hundred, right?
So that you should get a smaller decimal, right? Like point this is zero zero. Okay, and then the square root of that, this is what Q is equal to. Be point zero four four seven. Right? Okay, so this is in the isolated population and this is in the general population. So right off the bat, which two choices can you eliminate? Yeah, A and C, right? Because we want Q, right? And so now this says here, okay, the frequency in the isolated population is 0.0047 and it's 0 0.0026. Okay, so that's correct. Showing that the rate of mutation is highest among individuals in the isolated population. Or is it D? So we know in the isolated population it's much higher. Why did it get much higher? It's D. Right? Yeah, so they're isolated, so we had a little genetic drift going on, right? We had random gain of alleles, right? This population, because it was so small and isolated, it became more recessive as time went on. Okay? So that's why it's T. Are we okay with that? We're good? All right. You're right, Chris. We got <laughs> too much. <laughs> it's a lot, right? I know. I feel like tomorrow I'm going to get a Nah, you guys are going to be solid. Okay. Um, I, don't, I think we did this one. Actually, let's look at this graph. This is a good one. Okay. Number 12. Okay. So they did this study of um, finches on neighboring islands, and they showed that there's a single gene that controls if it's long or short feathers, right? And so they went to the two separate islands, and they looked at the number of finches with long tail feathers and short tail feathers. And these are the results. So on island one, this is what they had for long and short, and island two, this is what they had. So then they tell you they're in equilibrium and they're isolated from each other. Which of these shows the relative genotype frequencies? This was an actual question. So the easiest thing to do is you always solve for Q. Figure out what Q is equal to, right? Actually, you don't even need to do that because um, this is the genotype frequency. So you just have to figure out Q squared, right? So in this population, 598. Five ninety eight divided by twenty one eighty. What does that give you? What percent? And then the other one is uh, eleven ten over thirty five forty two. So with, what's the first one? Point two seven. Okay. What's the next one? Point three one. Right. Okay. So now all you got to do is say, okay, let's look at let's look at this graph. Let's look at little l, little l. And which of these graphs has it on island one at 0.27 and island two at 0.31, right? So this one is at 0.1 and 0.2. That's not right, right? This one is at like 0.2 something and 0.35. That's way too high. This one's at... Looks like 0 0.27, 0 0.31. I think this is it, right? And then look at C. That's really low. They're both below 0 0.1. So your correct answer to this one is C, right? And all you did was you had to just calculate what Q squared was equal to for both of them, right? And then just find the graph that matched it. You see that? We okay with that? All right. And I think there's one more I want to look at, and then I think we'll be done. Um, 12, 13, 16, 17. 9%, it's through 17. 9% of a population is homozygous recessive, right? At a certain locus. So assuming the population is in Hardy Weinberg, what is the closest? frequency of the recessive allele. So if 9% is homozygous recessive, right, that's 0 0.09, right? So you just do square root of that, right? 0.3? Is that right? That's it, right? Okay. What do you think? Are we okay with this? Yeah. Go ahead. Wait, you go back over that? This one? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So they gave you, absolutely. So 
they told you 9% is little a, little a. So 0 0.09 is what little a, little a is equal to, right? That's your Q squared, right? Because Q squared is always your homozygous recessive genotype, which is also your recessive phenotype, right? Always remember that. The phenotype and the genotype, it's the same thing, right? The allele is going to be the square root of 0 0.09, which is equal to 0 0.3. Got it? Yeah. You good? All right. All right, and I think that's it, right? I'm going to see if there's another 17. Oh, that is 17. We did this one already. Some of these we had done a while ago. Uh, oh, I like this one, number 20. In the large isolated population of insects, a uh, gene locus has these alleles, right? <clears throat> Big A and little a. And these are the frequencies going from the different generations. So as you went from <clears throat> the first generation to the tenth one, you can see what happened, right? So what we'll likely... <clears throat> Accounts for the change over 10 years. Which one? C. C. Yup. Right? It's not exhibiting random mating. This is one of the newer questions where they give you the question like as a negative way, right? Instead of saying, oh, the pop, you know, there's there's uh, non random mating going on, it's not exhibiting this. It's not doing that, right? Because you're Little a, little a shifted, right? This population is becoming much more hybrid. This is also another good question where they could say, notice how the population has become more hybrid. What's going on here? What kind of selection is that? Remember the three types of selection? You could either have, if this is your original population, and the new population looks like this, that's called stabilizing, right? Because you're, you're favoring the hybrid in the middle. If the population originally looks like this and now goes like this, that's directional, right? You're either becoming more recessive or more dominant, depending upon which way it shifts, right? So directional means you're, you're going this way or the other way, right? And then the other one that you get, which is messy, is this one, right? Where original population looks like that and then the new one does this, right? That's called disruptive. We see that with like birds with the beaks of finches, right? Either have big beaks or little beaks, right? Um, nothing in between because having an intermediate form isn't beneficial. Okay, so you either get large or small. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. How do you feel with Hardy Weinberg? Are we good? All right. You wanted to do electron transport chain, right? Yep. Okay. What specifically? Just want to know, just like do the whole thing, or There's one question on the zip grade that I was talking about. FADH and, and ADH and yeah. the difference that it caused. Okay, that was on the last one, right? That was on the yeah, exam three. Yeah. All right, let me let me pull that up. Let me see. Number sixty nine or fifty nine? Oh, right towards the end. Oh, yeah, I remember this one. So you give me this picture. Says, okay, on average, more ATP can be produced from nada than can be produced from a molecule of fada. Okay. Um, based on figure one, which of the following best explains the difference in AT production, ATP production between the two? So NAD contributes more electrons to the electron transport chain than fada does, therefore provides more energy. No. Hmm. It's not C. It's not D. I'm sorry, not B. It's either A or D. 
right? Let's see. The protons by oh here's FDH's protons. I I want to say D. <clears throat> 59 is D. Because when you look at this, it says it's protons are here and they're not getting pumped across. And so they're being utilized to combine with water. Let me see. Got to be the very last one. Right. They say D. The electrons of thought are transferred through three complexes of the electron transport chain with those. Oh, I missed that. I thought, I thought it was, I read this wrong. I was thinking like, oh, it's only going through these two. No, it's going to this one also. Not a ghost. These, so these electrons go through all of these versus going through three. Okay. I read that wrong. I thought it would only went through two. Okay. So that's why it's B. So when NADA drops them off, they get dropped off here. FAD drops them off to this next complex. And so these electrons go through here, which allows you to pump hydrogen ions here, here, and here. FAD is only pumping hydrogen ions through these two. That's like a nasty question. Why do you ruled out um, C immediately? I ruled out C because it's not decreasing the gradient. It's saying here... What it's saying here is it contributes more protons to the matrix, which decreases the proton gradient. But it's not, because these are going to get pumped across, or they're going to combine with the water. Yeah. That's why I ruled out C. I honestly read B too quickly, and I didn't read the second half of it. That's the reason why I didn't pick it. My fault. I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't, obviously. Um... But this looks like some of these protons might join with this. I've seen it represented that way, but it's definitely big. Okay. What else with electron transport? You want to just like the general like... It is for the mitochondria, right? In the mitochondria, oxygen is your electron acceptor. In the chloroplast, do you guys remember what's the acceptor? It's NADP. Right, the NADP, right, is going to pick up the electrons, and that's also going to pick up the hydrogen as well. Right, so in plants, it's NADP it becomes NADPH, right, and that's what's your hydrogen carrier that takes it to the Calvin cycle so that you can generate the glucose carbohydrates. Okay, the ultimate source of all those protons and electrons comes from where? Glucose, right, and the majority of the NADA and the FADA is made by what? process. Krebs cycle, right? So Krebs is where you finish completely hydrolyzing and breaking down, okay? Glycolysis, you're breaking the glucose down a little bit. You have a small release of energy and a little bit of not a release. And then when you go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, right, you're going to break off a little more NADH. Both of those you make two. So both of those reactions, it's two of everything that you make. And then that acetyl-CoA, when it goes into Krebs, that's where you just break the whole thing down. And that's where you get a tremendous amount of NADH and FADH2. That's where all the hydrogens get transferred, right? So that you can run your chemiosmosis, right? The purpose of the electron transport chain is to generate the gradient to run chemiosmosis. Go ahead. That's the motion of the hydrogen ions down that gradient to make ATP. So this arrow right here, that's chemiosmosis, where the hydrogens go down from high to low concentration to generate ATP. The only way that this happens is if you have a gradient, right? And the gradient is maintained by the electron transport chain, right? Um, and to keep the electrons flowing, you need oxygen here to pull those electrons out so you can keep the flow happening. If you don't have oxygen, NADA and FADA can't drop off their hydrogens, and you, you lose your electron flow. And then without electron flow, there's no more gradient, Okay. Chemiosmosis happens in plants, right? So chemiosmosis is, is, you see it in three places, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and bacterial plasma membranes, okay? 
So all of the stuff that happens in a membrane of a mitochondria or chloroplast also happens in, in prokaryotes, okay? Same thing with Krebs cycle and uh, Calvin cycle. Those happen in the matrix of the mitochondria and the, and the, the stroma respectively, right? But those also happen in the cytoplasm of a bacteria because they don't have those organelles, right? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So where it's specifically lower, where it's specifically lower is in that space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So where you build up the hydrogen ion gradient, that's where the pH is lower. Right, and then in the thylakoids, in the thylakoid space, that's where the pH is lower. Okay, and that's because of the hydrogen ions. That's how they knew that it was an ion gradient because they measured the pH, and that told them that oh, this is the result of, you know, hydrogens being pumped across, and that's where they came up with the chemiosmotic theory. Right. Um, are we okay with that? Okay. What else was another question? Something about bacteria, right? Yeah. What was it again? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was also, uh, yeah. That was AP Classroom. That was on the, oh, there's a poster. Let me just close these. So AP Classroom, that was, was that the gene expression one? I'm trying to remember which which set of questions that was. I think it might have been like one of the either in the middle or the, like. The yeah, I remember somebody asked about this one the other day. It wasn't in the beginning. So that's no, yeah, this was a recent one. Yeah. Um. I think it's gene expression. I think it's this. Is it this one? Let's see. If not, it's heredity. This one, right? Yep. Okay. So with these plates, right, when you don't have ampicillin, that means that you don't kill the bacteria, right? So you get what's called lawn. So the reason why it's all gray is because the entire plate is just loaded with bacteria, right? Now, if you add ampicillin, it kills them, right? So in this first one here, this is called the wild type E. coli because it doesn't have the plasmid. So they're not resistant to the ampicillin, right? On the second one here, um, it has ampicillin resistance. So the bacteria that are on plate four, all of those bacterial colonies, they're all resistant to the ampicillin, right? So they, they can survive with an antibiotic, right? This question they were asking for was which of the plates has the highest percentage of bacteria on it that are expected to make insulin? So what they said with this is they said, all right, we have this plasmid, we're gonna add the insulin gene to that plasmid, right? And, and grow them the same way, right? So the answer to this was four, because on number four, only those bacteria have the ability to produce ampicillin. So 100% of these bacteria produce ampicillin. On this one, and insulin, I'm sorry, they can kill, they can, they can live with ampicillin, they can produce insulin. On this one, you have bacteria that make insulin, but you also have bacteria that don't. So it doesn't have the same percentage. Right? Yeah, you have more bacteria growing here, right? You have an entire lawn, right, versus colonies, but not every bacteria transforms, right? And that's what they were trying to get at, is that when you do bacterial transformation, you never get 100% of your bacteria to transform. That's why you have colonies. Colonies represent the percent of bacteria that actually pick up the plasmid and can survive, okay? So you never get 100%, right? But on this plate, every single bacteria that's on this plate makes insulin and is resistant. Does that make sense? We're good with that? Okay. Okay. Are we, is that it? Yeah. Go ahead. Also, um, wild type means like normal, right? Say it here. Like wild type means like normal. Wild type is normal, right. So wild type is the unaffected or the normal form um, that has the normal alleles or the normal traits. And then when you add the plasmid, that's where you've, you've made a mutant, basically. Right now it's different. So wild type is what's normal you see, right? Unaffected. All right. We have five minutes. What else? Okay. Gene switches. Switches. Okay. So that's the whole thing with 
the pit X one, right? Yeah. Okay. What do you specifically? Well, I mean, it's not just like a question, just like the general structure. Yep. So okay. Do they, so they still have a promoter, right? They still have a promoter, right? You have a promoter that on the gene switch, you have your promoter that the RNA polymerase attaches to, and then you have the functional gene after that. That codes for whatever it's supposed to code for. That's like the structural gene. Right. Technically. Yep. And then you also have whatever is going up on top. Right. And then what's going on on top is you have the mediators mm -hmm. and the activator proteins that all have to connect in order for that to work, right? Mm -hmm. And the activator binds to the switch, which is way upstream on the DNA somewhere, right? So like if... Like here's your DNA, right? So your functional gene is like here, where my hand is. The switches are over here. So those switches come around like this, and they come in contact with those proteins, right? Yeah. Now what makes them do that is these proteins here have an affinity for the proteins attached to the switch. So the proteins, they're gonna find each other, right? And then when they do that, they link up, and then that releases the polymerase, and it makes the copy. Are we good with that? Okay. If there's no switch, the activators don't attach, and then you never get that contact, never gets made. Now, the whole point of that, is that just for RNA, like making... That's RNA? so you can, yeah, that's so you can trigger RNA transcription, okay. right? And then you make your RNA, and then that RNA goes to the ribosome and gets read. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say after you make the RNA, you're like, oh, we don't need that RNA anymore, right? Then you use siRNA, right, and miRNA, interfering RNA, which basically stops translation, and it breaks up the RNA, right? So, like, if this represents your RNA now... As the ribosome's moving along the RNA, the, the uh, miRNA and the siRNA come in and they just break this up, right? I don't want to cut my tuber, but it would chop this up and then your ribosome would just stop re reading, right? And you've only made a piece of a protein. And that's for gene silencing after you've transcribed, right? It's called post-transcriptional, right? Okay. What else? Go ahead. What is a positive control? Ooh, so a positive control is going to be, uh, actually, what is that Petri dish? It's where you put, you put bacteria, I can't find it now. Positive control is you're going to grow the bacteria with the plasmid just without doing anything, right? Without any ampicillin to make sure that the plasmid didn't kill your bacteria. So your negative control is your bacteria without the plasmid to make sure your bacteria survive, just that they actually have good bacteria. Your positive control is with the plasmid, but not changing any environmental factors. So you can make sure that the process of transforming didn't kill the bacteria, okay. right? So like if you grew them without the plasmid, I'm sorry, with the plasmid and just you know, put them on a plain old plate, if they died, that means that <laughs> you did something wrong in the process of making the plasmid. So you have to go back and refine it as well. Yep, so the positive control, make sure that the plasmid, making the plasmid and putting the plasmid in didn't kill your bacteria. Okay. Go ahead, Joe, and then I guess, what's up? Oh, I did that. Extracellular space is the space, it's outside the cell. So, like, if you have cells, right, like, you have, like, a bunch of cells in our body, right, the, the surrounding every cell is this material called the extracellular matrix, it's called the ECM for short, but that's got all like nutrients and stuff in it. That's the space outside the cell that we can pull things in. So like ions, like sodium ions, potassium ions, they're all in the extracellular matrix, right? And that's what's going to get brought into the cell. And then intracellular is within the cell. So like digestion within the cell, transport within the cell. Okay. Are we good with that? Okay. Got that. Oh, and Lena too. Good. Are there really weird things like, um, like tight junctions, stacked junctions, all the Sure, there could be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of weird stuff on this. All right. So, yeah. So, your, your, your gap junction is the connection between two cells, right? And that's what allows cells to communicate. So, that's going to be like the openings between the two classrooms, right? So, there's a flow of information. A tight junction is what holds cells together, right? Um, it's, it's watertight. And that's what allows them to function as a unit. Right. So like we have tight junctions between all the cells in our mouth and our esophagus and our stomach and our bladder. So we don't like leak food and pee into our bodies. That would be kind of gross. Right. It's got to be graphic. Sorry. So tight junctions hold cells together and keep it so that they're watertight. Right. A gap junction is the connection between the two. And plasmodesmata 
is a gap junction in plants. That's just an opening between plant cells so they can share cytoplasms and share ions and salts and nutrients and minerals with each other, okay? And then let me get Lena and then get you guys, go ahead. But like independent and dependent, factors? Oh, density dependent? Yeah. Density dependent depends on your population, right? So as your population gets bigger, these things have more of an impact, like competition, right? Because there's more individuals and predators and disease, right? And resource availability. So as you get more populated, it's harder to get food, it's harder to get space, you get more crammed up. That's density dependent. Density independent, it doesn't matter how big or small your population is, it's gonna affect you. That's like fire, flood, you know, cataclysmic event, human impact, hunting, right? Hunters take out everything, it doesn't matter, right? Okay? And then Eric, and go ahead. You got, okay. What? So the gap junction, that's the connection between the two cells, right? So in animal cells, we have gap junctions. They're regulated by proteins, and that just allows you to have cell-to-cell -cell communication, right? Um, we have that in our muscle cells in the heart, where the muscle cells of the heart, they can communicate with each other, so you get your electrical activity to go from muscle to muscle. Um, they're technically called intercalated discs. You'll never be asked that, okay? That's just the stuff that's in my head. Um, <laughs> And then a plasma desmata is the same thing, it's just a connection between plants. It's all about communication and flow of materials. Are we good? All right. You had a good night's sleep tonight. Eat a good breakfast tomorrow. Like if you eat what you normally like, do what you normally do before you come in. Like if you don't eat a big breakfast, don't eat a big breakfast because then you're gonna get sick, right? So but bring water. You can have water, you're allowed to have water in the room, I believe. Right? Are some kids in the classroom? Uh, no, no, everybody's in the L only a couple people are, but everybody's in the LG. So we're not split up. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to see you guys in the morning. So 7.30, 7.40, meet down by the LG. Okay. You guys got to sleep good tonight. Don't work. Don't stay up late. Don't study till 2 a.m. You can remind, text me. I have a meeting tonight, but I'll be around. What's up? Yeah, use pencil for this first part and pen for the second part, okay? Um, and that's it. You guys got this. You definitely got this. You're good. Have yeah. a good day. All right. I'll you got this, man. You guys got this. All right? Oh, what period? Oh, first. Did they, they do breakfast up here first? Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to probably be down with the other So, yeah. What's our phones in like bags? Uh, do we just... Phones in the bag off. Just make sure they're off. Okay. They're gonna tell you that tomorrow. Um, and your bags, your bags go right up in the front of the room. Okay. You, I was just, you don't even want to bring it. You guys drive? Yeah. Just leave it in the car. Okay. That's it. Like, I would even just do that. Like bring some, it might be cold in there, so bring like a sweatshirt or something like that. You guys get cold or not. I'm I sweat breathing, so for me, I'm like, you know, I'm dying right now, I'm like hitting badly. It's bad. Um, yeah, just you can, I would just leave the bag. Bring water in, you can bring water. Bring a little snack in a plastic bag or whatever. Then, because in between, you can grab like a quick snack, whatever you guys normally do, just to get through it. That's all. And then afterwards, you want to stay and come up here and talk. That's fine. You want to go home. That's fine. Whatever you want to do. Like, that's it's all good. All right. Yeah, I would be too. All right.